Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Bhutang Dhammang Sanghang Namasami Well, it's nice to see so many people turned out tonight, although I understand it's a fairly regular event. There's so many people come to listen to Dhamma here, so that's uh, it's very encouraging. But I feel I must warn you from the beginning that I don't know any jokes. <laughs> you can leave now if you wish. Okay, no one's left yet. (laughs) Um, I think the last time I was in Perth was about five years ago and uh, stayed at um, the budding nuns monastery for seven weeks and uh, Sister Vayama was in a caravan and and the laity very kindly hauled in another caravan for me. And uh, we met in a little tin shed so it's uh, that was a very nice time for me then as well. Then just leaving England and uh, and uh, coming over to Australia for a period of practice, it was very nice to actually experience that solitude in the bush out there, and especially the simplicity of the caravan. Actually, I remember feeling quite blissful about the simplicity of it. There's not too much you can start thinking about in terms of doing up a caravan or. <laughs> And at that point, it's very peaceful, and and you can really see coming out of um, you know, I'd come out from a largeish community. Amravati is a large community; it's very well established, and there's lots going on there. And it's very easy to get pulled in, like like anyone who has a a house and a family and a job and trying to make ends meet. Monastery life can be can turn into a bit like that just trying to make ends meet and uh, with a community of about 50 people trying to get the things that need to be done done and uh, do the teaching that needs to be done and so there's quite a lot going on so it was very lovely to come to a place that I didn't have any responsibilities and just live in simplicity for a while but it's also nice to come back and see what's been established there on the land the lovely um, house, which is the, the centre of the communal activity, and uh, a couple of good sturdy kutis with more walking meditation paths. And uh, I've been lucky enough to have been given a kuti to stay in. And again, I've really appreciated the simplicity of staying in, a, you know, a, a, a small hut in the bush, and uh, just enjoying that. It really, I find, it really does facilitate the meditation. But uh, it's not just simplicity of environment uh, because, as you all probably know, the longer you stay in one place, no matter how simple it seems to be, um, there's, you get involved. You start thinking about things. I mean, I've been, I'm just visiting now, so I'm not talking about my experience now because as, vis- as a visitor, you always, uh, it always feels good. You don't have any responsibilities and... Everyone's being nice to you and appreciating you, so that that's good. You're passing through. But wherever you settle, and as you all know in your own families and relatives and workmates, once you do get settled, habit patterns start to take hold. And this is just normal. It happens in monasteries as much as it does in uh, families and other workplaces. The difference is that in a monastery, uh, we kind of geared ourselves up for the fact that this is going to happen so uh, in, we've reminded ourselves of what we're there for you know we've actually being monks or nuns or going to a monastery we've made a commitment to practicing the Dharma and setting up the life in a way that's going to support waking up and letting go basically so that's you know part of the draw towards monastic life and it was for me in those um, 
earlier years of my life when I was searching for something that uh, that not only made sense, that but to be with like-minded people, to be able to cultivate a way of living that uh, led to realization. Or in those early days before I met Buddha Dharma, uh, the term I would use was ultimate truth. I knew there was an ultimate truth. It was just an intuitive understanding, but I hadn't actually come across Buddha Dharma. Uh, so I, I was just kind of on the search for something that made sense and particularly something that addressed this problem of suffering that I uh, not only experienced personally um, and could have, couldn't figure out why it was happening because uh, everything ar- around me looked like it was going okay, you know. I had nothing really to complain about in my life, good family, good education, good opportunities. I actually even felt that I could do whatever I wanted to do if I wanted to. <laughs> You know, I felt, you know, I, any door was open to me, but I didn't know what it was that would bring me the satisfaction or the happiness that I, or the peace, really, I intuitively felt was possible to know. I, uh, I, studies, I studied art as a young person, and um, as an art student, you, you kind of get a license to... Um, break the rules, to break down the the boundaries that the society sets up. So I was very much into doing that and thoroughly enjoying myself and challenging all sorts of things and uh, and searching really for happiness or um, some kind of satisfaction, I guess, in that. Trying to find the truth, the ultimate truth, by just pushing down the boundaries that I perceived were were um, keeping me trapped, you know, the society's expectations, family expectations, um, the conditioning of education, whatever. Um, and, I, and also, you know, at a time through the 70s and 80s, you know, AIDS wasn't yet too much of a problem. So, the, you know, free love, everything was was free and okay, so the feeling of wanting to explore on that level and feeling like everything was open for the, you know, for the getting. And I, for a few years I really just did whatever I wanted to do. And yet there wasn't happiness nor peace nor understanding really to be found. Actually, there was a lot of understanding ripening um, in interesting ways and I always felt that had something to do with art and the process of uh, creativity. So for that time, art was my religion. And later when I started practicing Buddhism, or actually what even attracted me to the path was realizing the similarities in what I was attracted to in the field of art and what meditation and Buddhism was teaching. Um, the teachings around the importance of awareness itself, of uh, the fact of our uh, inherent wakefulness is where uh, the seeds of wisdom and compassion truly lay inherent within our own mind. And, And this was very much an experience that I started to understand before I even met Buddha Dhamma in terms of that quality of awareness that was developing in in the process of art and creativity, of observing nature both externally and internally, and of looking at the process of this mind and emotions and what triggers what. And like every other human being, I was interested in uh, freedom from suffering because the experience of suffering... uh, at least in my youth, was quite prominent, but I didn't understand why it was there necessarily. Yet I intuitively knew that I needed to understand that before I would find peace or satisfaction. So this was what was missing before I met Buddha Dharma. I knew that the importance of awareness 
that cultivating that field was revealing truths about nature, about myself. But those truths weren't reflected to me in the society that I was living in. Or any, I was brought up as a Roman Catholic and the truths that I was discovering in that realm weren't particularly reflected to me in that, um, um, say, philosophy or, or religious practice either. And um, it wasn't till I actually f- heard the Buddha's teaching in its complete form for the first time and the teaching particularly around the Four Noble Truths the truth of suffering and the end of suffering, that it, it really hit me. I thought, my God, this is what I've been looking for. This is, this is it. It's something, a form or a teaching that's actually saying, there is suffering. Now, it's strange that I would feel relief upon hearing that, because it was an obvious experience. But no one was ever pointing to it saying it's, it's valuable, actually. Yes, we don't want it, but in our predicament, everyone, happen, everyone has it. In fact, you know, it's, it's a kind of a... Um, it's part and parcel with being born into this predicament. And to hear that perspective, it suddenly revealed a kind of a view I had been um, carrying. And it's just interesting, you don't really see views you have until they collapse... Mm. but we are conditioned by certain views now what collapsed in that that moment of hearing about the the four noble truths that there is suffering and that it has a cause and there's a way to the cessation of suffering it hit me that oh suffering is not my fault suffering is a truth a reality of this predicament it's not my fault and having that sense of um it being such a problem because ultimately it must be something to do with me or something that I'm doing wrong or maybe it was you know, deeply conditioned from a Christian perspective about being born in sin and uh, this kind of heavy duty stuff around guilt or something or the fact that um, you know, whenever one experiences suffering uh, often as a child one experiences suffering because you're being punished for something you've, din- you've done wrong or you've been told you're a bad girl or a bad person and you associate suffering with wrong, bad uh, and my problem. All sorts of things. But it was suddenly, it collapsed suddenly in the truth of hearing the, about the Four Noble Truths, this idea that suffering was my fault and therefore I had to do something about it to, so that I was no longer a problem or my life was no longer a problem. It kind of collapsed for a moment. And I experienced the relief of that. And another strange perspective, you know, later on in the monastery, I remember um, saying to uh, one of the monks, you know, you know what I like about being here is that it's okay to suffer. You know, because... Again, this is another kind of view that we hold on to, particularly in the world. When when we've made suffering into a problem, or uh, um, especially me and my problem, um, then we're desperate to find ways to get rid of it. And often we just end up trying to ignore it or pretend it's not there or try to do as many fun things or good things so at least we kind of balance it out. But somehow in the background, in our psyche, it's all niggling away, you know, still me and my problem and suffering. And suddenly just being allowed to, if you're suffering, if there's pain, recognize there's pain. It doesn't have to be made into a problem. Now we make it into a problem all the time and this is what what the path is about undoing. and sometimes, you know, the way that Buddha Dharma is taught, it is taught that, you know, uh, suffering is, is like the disease, you know, and uh, we want the cure so we can be free of suffering. But oftentimes just hearing the teaching on that level, whether it's actually being taught on that level or we just take it in, it can reinforce the views we have that 
if I'm suffering, something's wrong or it's not good or something's wrong with me or something's up, I've got to fix it up. It doesn't actually reveal a deeper uh, possibility of relationship to that suffering at that point. So we have to be aware, how do we take on the teaching at that level? Uh, yes, there's suffering, but the Buddha lifted that truth to a noble truth. And this is very important to reflect upon. Um, you know, as I said, we all experience suffering. We wouldn't be here if we didn't. And every being, in fact, not just human beings, experiences pleasure and pain. And this is part of being born. There's no escape from the dualistic experience once we're born into uh, a body, once we're born into a, a realm of existence. So what we've got to start to discern is just what, what is natural to this predicament and what is extra that we're putting onto it, that we're creating around it. Because that extra actually ends up being the bulk of what we experience as suffering and what we call uh, suffering. But it's important to begin to start to discern what's the natural suffering and what's the extra suffering uh, through ignorance that's um, being compounded here. So as I say, we all know that we're suffering, but mostly we're interested in how to not suffer. So we just see our attention goes to us, tell me how to get rid of anger, tell me how to you know, get bliss in my meditation, tell me how to be more loving. We all want to know these things. You know, tell me how to be free of fear. But maybe, do we, do we actually ask, tell me how I can be with this fear in a way that feels healthy? Or tell me how I can face uh, this grief in a way that I can grow from it. You know, this turning around of attitude is very important for learning and for freeing ourselves from suffering. Because the Buddha always taught that these truths of suffering and the end of suffering were conjoined. We can't separate them. We can't just say, just tell me about the end of suffering. He said, I teach two things. I teach about suffering and the end of suffering. And in this way, he's pointing our attention back to this very suffering that we experience because he's saying the reason why we can't find that peace or happiness that we we intuitively know is possible, the reason we can't find an end to suffering is because we haven't actually understood this suffering that we experience. It's only in turning towards it and understanding it do we realize how it comes about and what it actually is. And through that process, we experience, we can experience the cessation of that very same suffering. So it's like he's acknowledging our search for for truth, for ultimate peace, but he's saying we've, for centuries, for millennia, for eons, for countless world systems, we've been barking up the wrong tree. That's why we're still being born again. So his teaching is about understanding suffering. And this is what we have to develop many qualities of heart to begin to approach within our own lives. Now, fortunately, the path to awakening or the path of awakening to freedom from suffering is a really wondrous path. It has uh, many mysterious qualities, actually, um, but also many practical and pragmatic points of instruction. But just to, I mean... The one thing that 
going back to what I was talking about, this uh, awareness that I was attracted to when I was painting and uh, developing art, um, that's exactly what attracted me to that process, was this field of awareness that was felt as a very mysterious thing. It had no boundaries, like other things had boundaries. It didn't seem to have any... um, significant characteristics you could label it with or or hold it with and it was a, like a very vibrant alive space that continued to reveal many things in the changing nature of this mind and this body and the world that we live in so that's the way i like to approach the practice of this spiritual path the practice of buddha dharma because that's where it feeds the heart, that's where it stays very much alive. Uh, the truth that the Buddha taught, he said, was apparent here and now. It's not, even though on one level, yes, we have to put in effort, we have to do work, we have to develop meditation. If we think just like that, however, we've set up a huge project for ourselves, which can become painful in and of itself just that we've got this huge project, that I'm at this level of the training and I have to get there. And uh, according to our our habits of mind, we conceive of it in a certain way and we set ourselves up. The way I like to consider the practice path is, is contemplating that the Buddha said, awakening is only possible here and now. And it's always possible here and now. And that the truth, is here, now. It's not a, we don't have to go somewhere else to get it. We don't have to become a better person to get it. We don't have to get rid of the suffering we've got to get it. You know, because our, our minds are habituated to strategizing in this way and setting up agendas. But if we know how to look, if we know how to be in the present moment, reality can show itself or our minds can open to that level of dharma that can free us from ignorance, free us from the fires of greed, hatred and delusion. To me, I have to contemplate that this is possible because that's the only thing that keeps my heart alive because it knows that if any truth is worth anything, it has to be here and now, has to encompass this very reality. And that's, that's all there is. The past is really just, right now, is just a memory. When we really consider the truth of that. And the future right now is just an idea, a projection. And the truth of this is not ignoring the fact that there's been supportive conditions that have set up a particular predicament we call now. And we say, yes, that's the past. We're not denying that, but we recognize right now, in this conscious moment, it is just a memory. Right now is the result of many past moments, but that is also changing. And the future Perhaps there'll be a future for many of us, at least a limited one in this form. But we don't know what that's going to be. The present moment in its particular form is the condition for the next moment and the next moment for the next moment. But we never even know what that is really going to reveal, is really going to bring. So the future, just to recognize... Yes, it is a possibility right now, but the reality is always here. Now, in this here and now moment, the Buddha points out the truth of reality, pointing out there is a conditioned conditioned reality and an unconditioned reality. And the conditioned reality is usually what engages all of our attention. 
And what we attach to as being me and mine and consequently my problem. But he also pointed to what can be seen here and now is the unconditioned, otherwise known as the deathless or Nibbana. That this is also a reality that can be seen here and now. And with the realizing of this reality, there can be the undermining of the delusion that keeps us attached to the conditioned reality. So it's not a destroying or an annihilating of the conditioned reality, but a getting of perspective on it that allows us to see there is the conditioned and there is the unconditioned. He affirmed in the in the scriptures, the Pali Canon, he would affirmed there is the unborn the unoriginated, the uncreated, the unformed. These are all synonyms for Nibbana. He said if there weren't, there would be no escape from the born, the originated, the created, the formed. And these are all synonyms for the conditioned realm, conditioned world, conditioned things. He says, but since there is this reality of the unborn, then there is an escape from the born. So it's a very strong affirmation, even though in somewhat uh, negative terms, unborn, unoriginated, uncreated, unformed, but a very strong affirmation that there is that to be realized, and in the realization of that, one relinquishes attachment uh, in regards to the conditioned realm. And he summed up the conditioned realm to make things even simpler for us. He summed up the conditioned realm as being just this body and mind, in fact. These very five aggregates that we call body and mind. Now this is where it can start to challenge our ordinary habitual perceptions of self and the world. Thank goodness, because they really need to be challenged. That's part of our suffering is we get so caught in a small box-like way of thinking about this world and this body and mind, that it does become a prison. And the Buddha's path is about seriously investigating into the nature of reality, such that we challenge exactly what it is we think is me and mine and myself. And also with that subject comes the other, the world, that which is around us. But this very creation of subject-object, he said, is dependent on ignorance of the unconditioned reality. We get caught into a dualistic perception of reality such that me gets focused on this subjective experience of body here and then other or that which is not me gets projected outside of that perceived experience. And thus we create a world that we spin around in according to our likes and dislikes of the sense impressions, the sense experience, which have been conditioned over uh, many lifetimes, not just this lifetime. (coughs) Nevertheless, he begins and always comes back to this teaching around the Four Noble Truths, suffering and the end of suffering. There is suffering. This is a noble truth that suffering should be apprehended. We need to be able to turn our minds to that very experience in order to understand just what it is. Because actually it's not as big as we tend to think it is. It's just that much. But because of our ignorance about it, it gets blown up into a huge thing. So it requires investigation. So making that very experience into a noble truth means that it actually becomes the first signpost to liberation. 
And this can totally change our attitude towards our experience in life, where suffering has become just that that we need to get away from at all costs and by any means. But that habit, that way of being, just perpetuates the rounds of samsara, of suffering. So the Buddha is saying, wake up to the truth of suffering is our opportunity to then see the truth of the cause of suffering, the truth of the cessation of suffering, and understand that path, those path factors that bring that around, which is the fourth truth, the eightfold path. Now the skill of his teaching is that what we can experience in any given moment as we learn to focus on our present moment experience, if we look with this uh, paradigm of the Four Noble Truths in in terms of apprehending suffering, recognizing the causes that bring it into existence and recognizing how those causes are abandoned, if we can understand that on the macrocosmic scale in this present moment in our own experience, in our own mind, then the same truth holds. So, sorry, this is on the microcosmic scale. The same truth holds for the macrocosmic scale. If we can understand these causal relationships in the present moment with our own experience and undo that ignorance there, it undoes the ignorance on the larger scale. And the very same truths that you recognize in this moment or are able to come to see through following the Buddha's teaching, it, through seeing that in this moment, it also transforms one's whole life and one's experience of the world that transforms uh, the perceptions and feelings we have in relationship to our experience. So this is why it's encouraged to bring our attention to the present moment and by cultivating the the meditation, or first of all, the basis of a wholesome life uh, which supports the cultivation of meditation, but then to use that basis of established calm to begin to investigate into the reality that is your experience. This is where wisdom will arise and where liberating wisdom can arise and cut off uh, what's called the fetters to enlightenment can undermine ignorance and bring about complete freedom from suffering. So the way we do that is to really appreciate, I mean, what you start to discover on this path, even when you just start to to meditate, even if it's just for the intention of uh, freeing oneself from a bit of the the day-to-day stresses of life. But what you start to notice is that uh, how difficult it is to ca- just to calm this mind down and how many thoughts and preoccupations we have going on and just how much suffering that is in itself because what we want is calm and we just keep getting inundated with this, this other stuff that's going on. So this is really important to notice, not only that we've got a pretty crazy mind and that it's not as reliable as we thought it was and that we don't have as much control over it as we thought we had, but the fact that what we're doing there is pinning our hopes on I want calm and I don't want what's getting in the way of it. This is such a habitual mode we get caught into and I'm pointing it now out as a trying to emphasize how we can use this experience of suffering, whatever degree of it, as a signpost, first signpost to awakening, first signpost to liberation from suffering. So we have to appreciate that that's possible. So the first noble truth is lifting our sights to be able to recognize, ah, this is suffering, just to be able to put it like that, rather than this kind of half shadowy mumble in the background of the mind, you know, complaining about suffering and wanting something else, bring it fully into consciousness, that experience of misery or just feeling oppressed by the thinking, 
just say to yourself, ah, this is suffering. This is the first noble truth. You know, and this applies to, you know, even if it's a a physical pain or um, a deep mood of despair or whatever. It applies to all kinds of experience of suffering, niggling irritation to... to, um, the most red-hot rage you've ever felt, to be able to turn the mind and say, ah, this is the experience of suffering, not as a judgment of the pain or the emotion, but as apprehending a truth. Ah, this is what the Buddha was saying, is called dukkha, suffering. Just stopping it there, because we have so many conditioned judgments, so many conditioned assumptions, so much desire to get away from that feeling. We have to learn how to turn our mind towards it and wake up to it. Ah, this is dukkha. Because only when we bring our mindfulness, that awareness to bear upon that experience, can we truly understand it. And it is never ever what you think it is. And it's never ever what you have assumed it to be all along either. Because once you shine that light of awareness onto it, it changes, it shows itself to be something quite different. Now this is something that you need to practice, that each of us has to experience if it's going to have any effect. Because the path of practice is about informing the mind of truth as we experience it, and then that experience of truth at its mundane and supermundane levels inform the mind, give rise to wisdom. And it's that wisdom which starts to uh, dictate or start to inform the way your path unfolds, the way meditation unfolds. Because each of us will have uh, different questions, different concerns that we bring Um, in our lives, in our meditation. So maybe the answers that are there for someone are not the answers that are going to solve another person's problems or puzzles. We each have to find those solutions for ourselves. But we can do that by directly apprehending, first of all, this truth of dukkha. Ah, this is suffering. Being willing to turn towards it and recognize our opportunity there as practitioners to wake up to it. Now this is a a whole path of practice and training in itself because once we start to look inwardly we, we see many habits and a lot of them are turning away from pain. And that turning away is like actually turning a light out on ourselves and turning a light out on the possibility for awakening. So it takes the encouragement, our own encouragement towards ourselves to, to face this stuff, to be kind towards ourselves and compassionate towards ourselves when we are feeling pain. You know, because a lot of that turning away from it, the resistance and the moving away from it, it's the heart that doesn't know how to be present with pain. And that heart, if you start to look there, is encumbered by a lot of views and fears and, and judgments about that pain. A lot of self-images arise. So kindness towards ourselves. What is it to be kind towards ourselves when we're feeling pain? This is a question we bring into our practice. There's no answer to it. The answer comes when you ask yourself the question when you're facing pain and you find there are qualities of heart that come forward and that can embrace the pain. And that quality of awareness, of wakefulness that is cultivated in this path is so much needed as that which is not only a refuge but it's actually a powerful force for awakening, this quality of awareness that is perhaps the deepest aspect of who you are and yet it's so often um, 
kind of nullified, not noticed, not given um, the kind of attention or the, the kind of recognition that one uh, needs to give it in order for it to, to do its work. So for me, in my practice, this has been a major part of supporting myself to, to look at those painful areas of as I experience them and encouraging myself to take refuge in this quality of awareness that can know just what's present in this moment as it's manifesting. And that that is a refuge, that is the seed of Buddha, Buddha meaning one who is awake or awakened one. It's just this very quality of awareness that we all possess and that the more we cultivate it, the more power it has to be a refuge. I remember one um, monk telling me of uh, advice that was given to him from a, a teacher in Thailand, a forest monk, who told him that uh, in his early years as a monk that your job as a, as a practitioner is to discern the difference between awareness itself and the activity within awareness. Which I think is extremely helpful instruction because one can discern the difference between the two. And this is where we lose our refuge in awareness when we get caught up in the movement of the mind and the identifying with what's going on as being me and mine. But as soon as we remember to recognize awareness itself, suddenly there's a larger perspective. Suddenly we don't have to be completely identified with the activity within awareness, but there's this ability of the heart to just be aware and to be able to abide. We can cultivate the ability to abide and trust in that awareness. that is a quality, that is a perspective that can show us the truth of the changing world, the conditioned world, that which the Buddha pointed to is what we need to understand. Now quite simply he pointed out what we need to understand about this conditioned reality, particularly that we call this body and mind, is he pointed out three characteristics of existence And you've all heard them, I'm sure, many times over. And I hope you continue to practice with them. But the truths of anicca, dukkha and anatta, these truths can't be stressed enough um, as the pointers, the Buddha's, almost the Buddha's fingers pointing that here is the possibility for liberation. If you really see this truth of anicca, the truth of change, of impermanence, of transience, the fact that whatever arises in consciousness has this quality of change and is, it has arisen dependent on other factors. It has no substance which remains the same or that can be said of which that this is me or mine or myself that if we investigate into anything that we experience, whether it be sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations, or thoughts, feelings, perceptions, all of these things manifest this quality of change, constantly transforming. Even those things that we think hang around for a long time, like my depression, that's, that's just an idea, actually. If we really investigate my depression, you see that it's still a ferment of changing thoughts and feelings and ideas. Now this is so important to investigate because as I said, you're informing when you're in touch with reality and seeing the truth of that and that truth in this moment is the changing transient aspect of that experience. You're informing your mind of truth that's giving rise to wisdom. It's beginning to transform your understanding. 
it might not feel like very much at first and it doesn't sound like very much when you say it but actually the more you observe this quality of change in your in your own experience it has to be in your own experience not thought about or speculated about or theorized about but really tasted like when you're eating a banana you know you're eating a banana it's like you you tasting you noticing this quality of change and you know there in the moment it's changing this is in itself is changing um, the quality of your own heart that is usually oppressed by greed, hatred and delusion it's informing the mind of a reality similarly this truth of dukkha it doesn't have to be this truth of dukkha of all our experiences doesn't mean that everything is painful there is uh, three kinds of dukkha 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 viparinama dukkha and sankara dukkha and dukkha dukkha is just pain painful pain which is the obvious you know my knee is you know sending shooting pains of red hot flames or um you know this kind of obvious physical suffering and uh, viparinama suffering is a suffering of change the fact that nothing is stable it's on the move it has a nothing that you can really rely on so even the most pleasant feeling changes usually to something a little less pleasant so that's the quality of dukkha even in relation to pleasant things because you're recognizing there's no feeling that stays the same forever and even the buddha pointed out to those disciples who are very adept in meditation you know that they can't rely even on those sustained levels of pleasure from meditation because they're dependently arisen they are not reliable they are due, they are subject to change and he said that when you see that when you consider that what happens is you relinquish identification with it you relinquish ownership over it you relinquish the attempts to try to control it and get it just right because you recognize the futility of that at a deep level now this doesn't mean that we don't work to create an environment and a, a workplace or a home that's supportive it's not about not doing what we need what we can do you know to help this world be a more peaceful happy place it's not about that it's about seeing the truth on the level of where our pain really arises is in this attachment and identification to this body and mind as being who and what i am we project that reality onto it when we truly see that it's these experiences are changing they're not reliable that we can't actually find the happiness we're looking for there then what happens is something begins to let go and sometimes that can be a sudden letting go which can result in deep insight or sometimes it's a gradual letting go but either way it results in more peace and often an insight into the third characteristic which is anatta the the characteristic of these things these things that are appearing in consciousness and changing consciousness itself changing are not who and what i am and they have no substantial essence that i can pin this idea of me and mine onto because they've shown themselves in reality to be empty and it's with this insight that one experiences tremendous relief from the burden of making these things into me and mine and my problem and this is a practice that has to be done within our own karmic predicament within our own lives within our own meditation within our own hearts and mind from moment to moment now what's important to remember as i was saying before and and this is just a reminder and i hope you can continue to remind yourselves because we need to a lot that um 
when we experience whatever kind of suffering in our lives, to remember to, that this is an opportunity for awakening and to turn that light of awareness towards it and examine, is this permanent or impermanent, this experience? And let our mindfulness, our awareness work around it. Now whether that experience has arisen due to a physical sensation or a memory or a thought <clears throat> or concern about the future, try to recognize that. Ah, that, that grief arose when I had that, that memory came back of when someone abused me and it really hurt me because they were a friend or something like that. So you recognize, ah, that memory was ar- arose and then that feeling of grief came back. And maybe you'll notice even a bit before that that memory was triggered by um, you saw someone in the the street that resembled this person. You don't necessarily have to go looking for these things, but when mindfulness is present, you can notice the connecting factors. So then that grief that arises in the heart suddenly has a, a context, a dependently arisen context. So you recognize, ah, If there wasn't this condition factor, it wouldn't arise. It's not really who and what I am. It is an aspect that's triggered through memory of an experience, but I can also let it go. When we don't see the fact that things are being conditioned through many factors, that's when we hang on to it as being, oh, this must be really me and my problem, and we try to work it out some other way. And, you know, that's endless. We can try to work it out in many ways. But the Buddha Dharma's way of working it out is say, look right there. It's dependently arisen. It has this quality of impermanence, of unsatisfactoriness, and it's empty of self. And when you see it disappear, once you relinquish, when you really see it disappear, you recognize not self. It's not who and what I am. So you start to recognize what the path of letting go is about. It's not about pushing away things that we don't like. It's about waking up to the reality of what they really are, that they're just that much rather than huge things that we'd have to change the world to get around. Or, or making, the, yeah, making that thing, that grief in, to a big my, mean my problem or that anger And this is not denying the grief or the anger or whatever might arise. Again, it's acknowledging it and saying, oh, well, that that has arisen. That's present. And with the quality of mind that can embrace the experience of it in the present is that very quality of mind that doesn't attach, that allows it to cease, allows it to show itself for what it is. So as I say, this kind of practice will lead to the insight, will bring about the insight that then will inform your path. So the very instructions we have for cultivating sila, for cultivating meditation, it's all about coming more and more into the present and understanding what's actually arising in the present and cultivating the qualities of the heart that allow us to do that. And keeping, keeping the aspiration alive is about knowing that the Buddha affirmed this reality as being here and now, available here and now, to be seen by the wise for themselves. And with the seeing of it, suffering is allayed or suffering is dispelled. And we do that Often enough, wisdom grows strong enough, mindfulness grows strong enough that eventually it can cut through like a sharp knife, cut right through the, the delusion which tends to see things as permanent, as, as um, possibilities for happiness, as self, as me, mine and my problem. This is what the work of delusion is doing all the time. So by looking into anicca, dukkha, anatta and into the timeless present, all of this is starting to undo uh, those projections. And not through creating other kinds of thinking, but through just seeing clearly 
the reality of things. The Buddhist teachings are merely pointing those out for us to experience. So his invitation was, try out C. See. see if it works. So I'll stop there for this evening. And um, if there are any questions, I'm very happy to respond to one or two questions at the moment. Mm. Sorry? Mm. Oh, thank you. I didn't get to that, did I? Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, Sankara Dukkha is um, the Dukkha of conditionality. Just the fact that we're born into a conditioned realm um, has a kind of oppressive quality to it. It can feel like a prison. And the fact that we're identified with conditions as being self, there's no ultimate happiness or peace to be found in that. And this is often felt as a bit like more an existential angst or just a kind of a, a hanging over you. You, you can't really find... Um, there's no particular pain that's really bugging you or but this kind of existential quality of uh, of dukkha just being born into a conditioned world uh, means you'll die this kind of limitation is part of uh, sankhara dukkha Right. Sometimes it's helpful just to point out that those three kinds because, uh, you know, if you're not necessarily feeling any physical pain or, or you know, you get uh, people in perfect worldly conditions who are still suffering, you know, suicidal despair and they don't know why. Sometimes it's interesting to be able to reflect on how these different forms of dukkha manifest. But yeah, just to know this is suffering is the, uh, as the first noble truth, to waking up to that. But then trying to isolate in your awareness what that suffering is, it's sometimes helpful to know. You know, I'm not looking for a pain in my knee. I'm looking for this sense of being in prison or being stuck, just this all-pervading sense of dissatisfaction, this kind of thing. If it helps, use it. It's part of the teaching. Yeah, Different things are helpful for different people. If you know suffering, then work on making it into a noble truth. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yes, it usually is. Yeah. yeah. Did you say, is there a middle way? <laughs> oh, for a lay person to, so it's not so difficult. The spiritual path is difficult. Um, you know, that's partly what I was trying to point out. Um, Everyone wants to get free of difficulties. Just please tell me how to get free of difficulties. And there's a, there's a story where His Holiness the Dalai Lama was um, giving teaching and someone in the audience asked, what's the quickest way to enlightenment? And the Dalai Lama sat there and he started crying, shedding tears. And he just says, it's, you know, everyone wants the quickest way, you know. Uh, you don't you don't get anything I'm not sure what he said after that this is my reflection now that you, you don't get anything that's really worth anything unless you put the you know you really put the effort the work in and if we're we've been stuck in this uh, predicament for who knows how long um, Ajahn Chah said if it, if it was any easier to get enlightened there'd be a lot more enlightened people around the fact is there isn't so but the skill of the Buddha's teaching 
is, you know, it is possible here and now. The right perspective and the, the, sh- the cultivation of the very factors of mind that you already have. And if you, you know, it's like sharpening a knife or an axe. And then if you aim correctly and cut through, then you can sever it. So it's important to get those teachings that actually point to what we really need to do. And maybe that's what you mean by a middle way. What he referred to is like just the the handful of leaves. You know, there's a whole lot of things, as many leaves as there are in the forest, a whole lot of things that he knows. But what he teaches is just like a handful of leaves because that's just what's needed to cut through suffering to get to the other shore, which he said was the important thing. So we need to, you know, and in his teachings, in this tradition, the core teachings are very much over and over again pointed out. You know, suffering is because of uh, clinging to the five aggregates, this body and mind, form, feeling, perception, mental formations, consciousness. And when that clinging is abandoned, when we abandon uh, this possessiveness, this holding, uh, then the cessation of suffering is tasted and realized. So, you know, just within that framework and the fact that he says the way to see how to let go of these things is to see anicca dukkha anatta. So that's not a lot to remember, but if you really want to investigate that in yourself, it's a lifetime's work. And, you know, do it if you want to. Everyone has different priorities in life, but when suffering becomes a, a certain intensity, if you've heard the Dharma, then you know really give it a good try. Because personally, I haven't heard anything else that really works. And this uh, this can be tasted in a moment, and you'll understand that truth in a moment, even though it implies. If, you know, a lifetime's cultivation of those very same insights. And, uh, so, you know, it's, as it's been said a lot, uh, many times, and I'm sure you've heard many times, it's, it's simple, but it's not easy to do. It sounds simple, but it's not easy to do. But that's exactly where we learn, is in our own karmic predicament. And if we don't do the learning there, then we don't get free. So that's, you know, that's good motivation. That's where it's happening. But that's where you can taste freedom too. So it's, it's really worthwhile. Thank you.